All right. Good afternoon. It's 415 in Tucson, Arizona. Beautiful sunny winter day. We're glad you all could be here and we're glad that everyone is out there in the real world on the web tuning in right now. We'll find out soon how many people. And don't forget, you too can ask questions. Type them in and Dave uh, Bogner will uh, pass them off uh, to me. Questions will come from you at the end of the presentation of our, um, of our distinguished speaker today. Um, in the audience, I'll just remind you that when you ask questions, we'll come around with the microphone. And again, you're welcome to introduce yourself. So, uh, my name is Gene Giacomelli, and this is the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center Covering Environments Seminar. Rafi Gruner, please, yes. with the introductions. Okay. My name is Rafi Gruner, and I uh, now feel like I'm part of everybody here because I've done that several times now. I'm very glad to do it. Heute haben wir, ich bin sehr froh zu introduzieren, Dr. Herr Professor Fritz Schroeder. Uh, that was a joke that uh, Jim made me do. I speak a little German, but uh, not enough. Um, so. Uh, Dr. Schroeder is uh, an expert in vertical growing, vertical uh, hydroponics, and um, uh, I showed, uh, Dave, if you can uh, put that thing on so it shows. Um, I got this from one of his recent, uh, actually not so recent publications, and I was very uh, 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 enchanted to see that he has very good helpers uh, that help him grow um, the produce that uh, he grows in these vertical farms that uh, he will talk about. And his specialty is in basically uh, finding out and elaborating new methodologies for solving important problems that come up when you take plants that, at least for us humans, for the last 10,000 years have been growing out in the field and he takes them in and puts them in an environment that is very strange for them, but they can grow, they can produce, and he will tell you how he optimizes the system. Thank you very much for coming to Tucson. Thank, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here to give this presentation today. And we came up with this idea when we went to a conference this year in Portugal and I met Gene and he's giving his talk about his lunar solar project and a lunar um, greenhouse project and I say, okay, I like to see this. I have to see it in person. So we came up with the idea that I come over for a couple of days here and today I met an old friend again, Mel Jensen. We met us the first time 92. So I feel like a student for a lifetime to see you again. I get a lecture today from you again. And this time we went to uh, Orlando, to the Epcot Center, and you set up all the fancy hydroponic stuff over there, and this was the first time I have seen this. I took many pictures. i still using the pictures for lecturing the students. Uh, they have no idea these pictures are ancient. They are many, many years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. For, for students, they are maybe 18, 19 years old. The pictures are 21 years old. This, this means, uh, what, you know, you want know what it means and but after two days here and I've seen so many new things and went to the biosphere too and so on and all the um, greenhouses right here I crushed my my hair or my, my head no hair anymore and I was thinking oh what can I tell you new so but maybe we can share our experience in hydroponics we can share uh, informations and hopefully maybe we can even exchange students from Germany to Tucson and forward and backward. I spread some information about Dresden, where I come from, and like to show you a little bit of our university, where I come from. Uh, you know this? Ah, uh, yes. I, I like to follow this um, schedule. I give you an introduction, a background, why we are doing this, and I like to present some uh, results of our research, of our team, and then i like to conclude everything a little bit. And I hope we have a lot of questions and we can discuss things. And we can discuss things, what comes next, what's the future, 
So with the students, that's maybe your task for the future to come up with new developments. So this is where I come from. This is uh, Dresden. This is uh, our campus is out of the city near a really nice castle. This castle was actually a summer castle. We have plenty, as you can see, green over there. We have uh, plenty water during the year. We have uh, enough water to grow without irrigation system outside. But we have just a growing season of uh, six months. And uh, now we have a winter, and winter means in Germany, in this place, it's really cold. It's, we have snow, and we have no light. We can grow plants. Uh, even in the greenhouse after mid of October. Then we have low light conditions and the plants just resist over there, stay there, but they're not growing anymore. We have low light conditions. And this for a couple of months. But here this spot actually is located near a river and there's a special climate. And 300 years ago the king came to the idea, okay, I like to have a nice place for a uh, uh, castle for pleasure and I like to have all the new plants, he likes plants as well, from the new world, from this part of the world. And at this time, they start with the first so-called orangery or greenhouse where they store all the orange trees. They came from here. And maybe tomatoes or uh, potatoes and so, and so on. And this was built, this building is about 300 years old. So, and the king vanished about 120 years ago in uh, Germany. No, not this, uh, almost 100 years ago, sorry. And then he built up another greenhouse. This was built 160 years ago. This is so-called palm house with heating system, ventilation, climate control, irrigation, all the stuff, 170 years old. At this time, this was the best equipped greenhouse in Germany, maybe in Europe as well. So, long time ago. And the red circle over there, this is our building, our campus. And these buildings actually belong to the old castle. My office is in the laundry. <laughs> and our lecture rooms are the, the stable of the horses, something like this. But it's not smells anymore they were there, so it's, it's clean now and it's filled up with young students. It's, I like this combination, old buildings, it's like a living museum. And this is our research facility, our greenhouse research facility, in total about 1.2 hectare, one roof, mostly one roof because we have to save energy. This is a, a picture from fall. You can see the trees turn to yellow and red or something like this. And um, this is one spot. And actually, this greenhouse was built first time 120 years ago from the king as well. So he cut all the features in the, field, in the past. So he, we, need, we need greenhouses to get all the fancy plants from all over the world, to collect them, to show them to have it, to have the, these plants. We renewed this greenhouse 15 years ago, in year 2000, 2001. Completely new. Uh, the technique and technology comes mainly from the Netherlands. We're using uh, Venlo-type greenhouses and we have all the equipment from uh, the Netherlands as well. And if you look into the greenhouse, it looks like this, similar what we have seen right here. And uh, we can do all the irrigation control, climate control, and we can do uh, randomized trials over there. And you can see a, a cucumber crop, uh, maybe with rock pool or substrate culture with preparation. So what is vertical farming? After I jumped in this pond, in this pond, uh, start swimming with hydroponics 30 years ago as a student. So I got all the information and the developments in the last 30 years. and there was a time we are coming up with vertical farming. So what does it mean? This is a fancy picture image I got from a, a newspaper or something like this. And this is quite interesting to see in the newspaper what the, our customers are thinking about the future of agriculture. They are actually dealing with, they have, they have some, some ideas, they, they expect something from the growers and from the researchers as well. And so I took some pictures by myself. This is in uh, China, on, it's a rooftop, uh, or we call it urban gardening on the roof. And there somebody is growing vegetables within the city where no farmland is available. 
if you become rich with such farming systems, maybe you have a park like this over there. This was in the same uh, area. I could take the pictures in each direction and you could see most of the tops of the roofs are covered with, with plants in these uh, cities. I think this was in Shanghai. And this was 15 years ago. There was the so-called World Expedition or uh, World uh, Expedition um, Exposition or Expo 2000 in Germany, Hanover, and the Dutch uh, built up a um, fancy pavilion like this. And in the third floor, as you can see here, there was there was a park, tree, something like this for recreation, and they had some hydroponic stuff right here in this in this floor on top some alternative uh, energy uh, stuff, wind generators, solar panels, something like this. This was 15 years ago. And the people are really interested in to see it, the queue in line. Actually, the Germans don't like to queue in line like the Americans. You have, them, you have a lot of skills of that, but, but we did, as you can see, yeah, we did. So what, did, what does it mean for me? The people are interested in new technologies. They are, they are willing to go this next step because why they like to live in cities. They not like to live somewhere else in the countryside or something like this. They like to live in cities. Um, we mentioned this uh, earlier this day. This year, there was the same expedition, uh, exposition and or fair in Milano, Italy, and they realized some these apartment houses with a lot of green around. You can do this. You can do this in such an environment, not in Germany. In Italy, you can do it because the growing season it maybe is eight or nine months, not only six months. So it's going to be ugly in, in Germany for six months if you have trees without leaves and something like this. And you have to maintain this as well. You need a lot of skills to do this. I'm pretty sure not everybody here is living here has time to do this or has the skills to do this. So there's a lot of labor either. So, so and this is my favorite picture, American Food 2.0. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe you will get not different food in the future, less sugar, less uh, calories or something like this, or sugar-free. <laughs> but as you can see here, they covered one wall of the whole pavilion, of the whole exposition, uh, exposition hall, with hydroponic vegetables. So they grown hydroponic vegetables over there, and they show up how we can use the third dimension of this uh, wall. And this is not a view to the same to the same wall. You can see here all the different vegetables and even um, uh, cabbage was grown over there, herbs, basil, all different kinds. But you can imagine it's hard to harvest this for showcase. Very nice to see it, and the people are really interesting interested to see it. If you're going back, you can see the line right here. We queue in line for two hours or something like this, just to see it. Yeah. And it's worth to see it. And the topic of this expedition was this year, food, foodie. How we can feed the population in the future, how we can feed the world. So now I think it's a growing concern of many, many countries and even of governments. They're thinking forward, well, what's next? Can we feed the growing population in the future? So we have some examples right now of uh, so-called plant factories in um, Japan. They have a um, program running from the government. They're doing this with uh, governmental money or tax money to push this industry forward because they're running out of farmland. They have a growing population running out of farmland. And I can tell you, I've been in Japan this year after Fukushima. They have a bunch of other problems too and they lost a lot of farmland. They can't grow there anymore food. And even they couldn't uh, feed the animals from this area. So and just some pictures, you know, well known. You know, if you search in the internet, you will find such type of, of pictures of so-called plant factories. They are running in Japan, but I heard the truth. Some of them went out of business because the economy. You have to do the calculations before. You have to sell the product and you have to cover the cost. And further on in the internet you will find 
really nice yeah, visions of artists. They're thinking about the future, how we can, how get the, the architecture can fit our our cities, even downtown should be nice, should be look nice, fancy, something like this. You can see the source where I, I put the picture from in the internet. Uh, but uh, we thinking about this as well, and another another example right here, and even. I, I like this picture as well. This is something like a complete farm. A lot of different crops, even chicken and the egg productions over there. Everything in the, is in the city and now we have a vertical farm. There's all the different stuff the farm actually uh, has on the countryside as well. Does this work? Can this work? Is this the future? Yeah, somebody is doing no. No. Maybe you're right. Let's see. And there was one project made in German from the German Space Agency called Vertical Farm Eden. And I'd like to go into this project a little bit deeper. And they decided to create or to model um, 37, 40 floor um, uh, high building. And you can see here, um, this is speci specially designed as a vertical farm. They did all the calculations, all the math. Uh, all was even. It's a new building, specially designed as a vertical farm. And we're talking about the CO2 footprint. And as you can see, if you're looking to this uh, footprint of this farm, you can see we can save a lot of. This is a farmland for open field production. So we need about 215 hectare compared. To this vertical farm, we can save, or we can uh, yeah, save a lot of farmland, and the footprint. Finally, if you put this vertical, it's really, really low. It's 0.2 hectare for this type of building. So we can save a lot of space of farmland, or we can sp uh, save space in cities uh, itself. Coming to the to the data. We have the calculation of the input, so what we have to add in this building. And the first one, what you can see, is electricity. It's power. And it's a big number right here. And coming later on to the percentage, then carbon dioxide, fertilizer. Then in this farm, they are using uh, aquaponic systems as well, because they are really, really uh, popular. Uh, for the customers, they like to see the fish production and the, the lettuce production, what we have seen today as well. And then they see, you can see the water input, the stuff, and the uh, operation costs, and so on. And you can see the output of this whole facility, um, eatable biomass, uh, ineatable biomass, tilapia, filet production, and so on. If you're looking to the costs itself, we can see, oh, sorry, here. If you're looking to the cost itself, about 45% uh, is need for power, electrical uh, electricity, 45%. We made this calculation with a German cost of a kilowatt, and this is about 30 euro cent. I know you pay much less of them, yeah? The same for gas. We pay in, in Germany right now six euro a gallon. You pay about two. Yeah, this is different. Okay, so we have to move this project to US so we can save at, at least here uh, a lot of money. But the building itself takes about 25%. The building itself, the investment costs. It's, it's a lot as well to come to this figure, and then we have to equip the whole greenhouse, it takes about 23%. And actually, most of the time, the stuff cost is most expensive or most uh, the highest uh, percentage, but in this, in this case, it's just 6%. It's just 6%. So if you like to come up with a vertical farm, we have to keep an eye or we have to look at this, of these two figures, electricity mainly used for Supplemental lights 
and the building itself. And if you're looking a little bit further, this is a floating city for about 50,000 people. They can afford this. Yeah. And so you can see this is for the harbor. You can go in with your nice cruise ship or whatever you, you own. You can live there and they're producing vegetables, fruits over there to feed these populations over there. So this is a, a vision. Maybe we're coming up with such type of cities soon because we're running out of space along the coastline. Yeah, We have tall uh, hotels and buildings right there, but the next step we're going offshore, something like this. So now we're coming to uh, our project. Also, first the challenges of this century. Yeah, we have to look for sustainable agriculture and land use. Um, sustainable, we had a meeting this uh, in September this year with all the scientists in agriculture, horticulture. We came together talking about the future, our visions, whatever, and we talked first, we don't use sustainable anymore. It's overused. It's, it's done. Because nowadays we call everything sustainable. Sustainable. But what does it mean? What is sustainable? We're using this, but we, we have no definition for this. So maybe we're looking for, for safe food, quality, quantity, pesticides, and maybe, uh, of course, the customer is looking for the price first all the time. But safe food, yeah, something like this we, we talked about um, right here. And no, no, um, um, local beats organic, yeah? But what's next after local? What's next? What's after local? Regional? It's the same. Safe, safe, food safety, yeah, 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 something like this we do actually. Pesticide free and all the stuff we have actually. What's next? Come on. Taste, taste. Oh, we have good taste. And we're talking about taste, yeah. If I go out with my wife, yeah, at the evening for dinner, and we like to drink something, so we have two different tastes, and we will have a trouble if we come together with a taste, yeah? So this is impossible, even for two. Don't talk about taste. <laughs> what is taste? We are from Northern Europe. Our tomatoes tasting like acid. We don't like it sweet. Yeah? You like it sweet. You talk about Excel or something like this, like in a wine. <laughs> we, we like it sour. Even apple. The apple way too sweet for us right here. We can't eat this type of apple. It's too sweet. Okay, what's next? What's come up next? You have no idea? We, we're talking about local. We have no definition for local. Local wars. Local food. I, I went to the internet. This is about 15, 18 years old. Local food, local wars comes from San Francisco. And the radius for local wars, the radius was 150 miles. In, in, in the paradise, in the paradise of food production, 150 miles they call local. <laughs> what you're talking about. Is this local? <laughs> okay. And all the companies cheating right now with the term local. They have a letterbox near Berlin and they call this local. Yeah. Local production. No. What's next? What comes up soon? Urban agriculture. Uh, you're right. But just in case we're talking about. We're talking about about urban agriculture up to the next vacation. And then somebody has to care this plants, watering, whatever. And if you fail, if you fail two times, three times, you quit this urban horticulture in your family maybe, in the backyard, believe me. Vacations are the, the biggest competition for home growers. Yeah, vacation. What's next? Actually, it's quite easy. Just watch or go to the internet 
and search. What's next? You're drinking water? Is this water? Oh, sorry for this. This is water. And if, if you look to the big companies, they're selling water. They call this pure, clean. A big issue. Clean, pure water. And they're talking about the big ones. And I think this is next for vegetables. Because the reason for this is the companies, the producer, growing very fast. They're growing very fast. And if they have an issue with a quality problem and they have to call back the tomatoes, they have a big problem. We have the problem right now with our good car industry, Volkswagen, you know. If it would be a small company, nobody cares, but Volkswagen. And they have to call back about 3 million cars. And then the question is, how deep is your pocket? How deep is your pocket? And for this reason, we come up next with clean, pure vegetables and fruits. Even the, we have a, in, in, in Germany, we have five supermarket chains left. And if they have a problem with pesticides and sweet pepper from Spain, they have a big problem. Because 100 million immediately, they have to call back everything. Now we have new quality management system or we have the regulations from the government about the residues in, of um, pesticides in fruits and vegetables. The supermarket don't care. They have their own one. They allow just 11, 10, 11% 11 of what is allowed from the government. They have their own quality management system right now. I could, could say everything what you get in the German supermarkets is almost pesticide free. And this is a regulation from the supermarket itself. And next year, Lidl and Schwarz step into the US market. This is uh, one of the big ones in, in, in Europe. And you will see what happens over here. Walmart tried to do this in, in Germany, they failed. We'll see the opposite, how this works. And they have their own quality management system. Okay. Coming up, you have to read maybe global warming, environment pollution, food crisis. This is of, still of interest because all food crisis in the past leads to political crisis. And even the government can, or they, they push out the government. It happens. It happens in France. The French Revolution was a result of two failures in agriculture. It happens in, in uh, India. Two times they changed the government. The reason was, in India, the price for onions went from 50 ruby to 80 ruby a kilogram. This is enough to push out the government. Incredible. So for this particular reason, maybe we have, we have a, 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 a possibility to talk to the government. We can save your power, but you have to support us and support us right here. We, we shut down, or we, we did actually everywhere, we rolled around, agriculture, research, and education, up to 30 to 40 percent around the world. Why? Food is so inexpensive. It's available everywhere. It can grow everywhere. We can import this easily. Really? Maybe not in the future anymore. So there are many challenges of this um, century, and we have to aware about this. And we, at the universities, we have to deal with. The students, they have to, have to come out with new ideas and visions about these problems. So we have an increasing population, we know, and we have this urbanization. Actually, it starts in, in Europe six, six, seven hundred years ago. The city starts growing, and we couldn't stop this now. Seven hundred years ago it starts, and nobody can stop it. So if you're looking to mega cities around the world, more than 10 million people living there, then we can see a growing number. And nobody can stop this development. Nobody can stop this, what's going on over there. The people like to be there, better life, better income, better job opportunities, something like this. And on the other side, we are losing farmland. We're losing farmland. We have just a certain amount is available, 1.4 to 1.6 billion hectare around the world. So the, that means 
if we count this with the population, just 0.2 hectare will be left in year 2050. It's, it's a hope, maybe. Because we are losing, in Germany, we are losing every, every day 250 acres, every day. And around the world, we are losing 30 hectare per minute. I'm talking half an hour, you can count 900 uh, hectare in this time. And nobody can stop this either. So this, we are losing this for deserts, erosion, salt um, developments, uh, we build up new cities and so on. So then if you're looking to the map of the, of the world, we have many places where we have food a crisis, food crisis with violence or natural disasters or droughts. And you can add, oh, not here on this map, droughts like California or like this part of US. So there's a drought for four years and maybe here we have to add this right here. We have a problem with water. We have no low problems, we have maybe high problems and maybe next year if they don't get enough snow in the high Sierra in, in California, they, many crows have to go out of business because they have no water anymore. Hopefully not. So now we're coming to a project what we are coming out. It's called brick-borne farming. I like to explain what it means, something like soil-borne, air-borne. And we have a website. If you like to follow our project, please check this website frequently and you will find there some news, some publications and uh, something from YouTube as well. So what we are doing on this project. We try to uh, get money from the government, about 50 million euro. This was the so-called Horizon 2020 project, but uh, we, at the end we failed. So we missed 50 million euro to do this project, but we're still working on and we're looking for other sources to get the money to uh, be in this business or this, this research. And why we call this brick bond farming, we have many, many buildings in Germany with a typical German style made of bricks. And this is a building, it's about 80, 90 years old. It's a nice architecture. It was a slaughterhouse within the city Dresden where I come from. It's out of business since 30 years, something like this. And the owner owns this and it's under conservation. And this means by law, the owner has to keep it in this style. And they, they have no idea what they can do with, with the building itself. If you looking inside, it looks like this. It's empty, more or less clean. And the property manager came to us and asked us, what can we do with old buildings? We had something about vertical farming. Can this building fit maybe your demands? And so we, we started actually in Dresden, close or near our university, with a project we call this brick bone farming. Again, you can see the bricks. And we need an, not a new term for, for this project, so that's why we came out with the name brick bone farming. And we like to bring the plants into this building. And if you have an old building, you have to look at this and you have to look, what can we do with such type of buildings? Is this, can we use it for which type of plants, which crop system, and so on? This building is actually made for processing uh, industry, has plenty equipped with, as you can see, the empty space. Left and right side, there are elevators, so transport is not, a, not an issue. You, you have loading ramps for, for trucks and something like this. So we came up. Uh, and try to develop this for the, for the property manager or for the owner. And we came up with, in each floor should be something different. So we like to do actually this was Merle did at Epcot Center to show different crops, different growing systems in a way to the customer of, of, of the city Dresden or of Germany to show them like a showcase what comes up next. So we can start with some mushrooms over here, not magic mushrooms or something like this maybe Chicago or <laughs> then uh, we, we like to add the aquaponic system. We like to show uh, strawberries on raised, raised gutters over there 
is a, actually a Dutch system and we like to use a lettuce in the A-frame system. Uh, maybe we can grow herbs and farmer, uh, farmer plants as well. Uh, cucumber and tomato and high wire system. On top, there is space for a nice restaurant or for teaching facilities, lecture rooms to teach classes or even uh, customers how to deal with. And you can sell the products over there as well. This was our idea. Uh, we're still working on it. Uh, everything is available and we checked, let's put more or less, uh, we checked the cost and the risk for the owner of this building, actually it's a supermarket chain, was too high. He, he said, I can't take the risk. The problem was the energy cost. So we have right now no solution for this energy cost or for the supplement light. Uh, we, we, that's one of the topics next, if you're talking about it. So this, finally, this should have so it looks like this, but there's a mistake. Where's the mistake in this picture? What is the mistake? For vertical farm. The windows. We don't need windows anymore. Because if you give supplemental light at night within the city, then we have the same problem like this morning when we in front of your LED light, like, oh, what's this? We like to get to bed and to sleep. So we, we don't need windows anymore and just few plants can uh, use this, this light from, the, from uh, outside, but not all. So we, we have to close the windows and to, be, to be safe so we can grow 24 hours a day, actually plants over there. That's, or we have a photo period of 16 hours or maybe 20 hours, we can use this. So what we like to do, we like to come do the sustainable and most innovative food production system with a low uh, footprint. We like to come to a safe food or clean food close to the market, close to the city or within the city itself. Uh, we like to come to um, uh, stability of prices for food, so stability for the production, for the producer itself and for the customer. We like to re reuse um, the resources, we'll be talking about uh, water use efficiency or something like this, uh, low CO2 footprint. We like to recycle everything as much as possible. Of course, we have output because we are selling products. So this is, we cannot recycle everything, that's, that's for sure. Uh, this is interesting, we can create jobs and income within the cities. I'm talking about mega cities, 10 million and more, there are a lot of poor people, maybe homeless people, they have no income, maybe they are willing to work over there. On the other side, we have the big problem of stuff in, in our um, companies, they're producing vegetable fruits, yeah, we have big demand for, for labor over there. In Europe, we have all the East European uh, guys comes from and they work in Germany, something like this, but in the future, we will have um, a gap of labor. And of course, we have some benefits like at the Biosphere 2. So if the people can see within the cities some green, they feel better, maybe they're more healthy and something like this as well. So the potential of cities, this is an image from Sao Paulo I, I did uh, years ago. Um, you can see we have high potential of buildings and in Sao Paulo they have problem, many of the 50 floor high-rise buildings, they can't be used for humans anymore. They can't handle this over there. They have social problems, a crime and whatever. So they are, they are actually closed completely. They are, there's no use for and they're looking for possibilities how you can use this. But you know, if you have a small apartments, small rooms, whatever, so it's inefficient to produce plants over there or vegetables. So. But the potential for buildings is everywhere, given maybe um, old facilities, storehouses, even military facilities are not used anymore. Uh, this is one of my wish, we don't use this anymore, but nowadays it's a different situation again, sorry for this, or high-rise buildings. And even in Berlin, we have, we have high-rise buildings, we can't use it anymore because it's hard to handle this for the facility management if you have 30 floors and more and you have different families living there 
and some of them are poor, some of them rich, and it's hard to get families out in Germany if they can't pay the rent. Yes, it's really hard to get this, them out because we don't have homeless people in Germany. They have a right to stay in an apartment. Yeah, yeah, you're looking. <laughs> it's right. We don't have homeless people. Okay, so we come up with a research program. We're talking about hydroponics and aquaponics systems. We um, have an eye on the supplemental light, LED was our hope, was our hope, was our hope, is our hope, but it isn't actually. So when we came up with LEDs and working with, so then we find out, okay, needs a lot of energy as well, it's really expensive, we have to cool them down with water, and at the end maybe they're losing their efficiency. So not what the industry are, um, promised us, so we will save all the problems with LED. Maybe next step will be organic LED, OLEDs, or plasma light. Uh, then we need a new sensor technology. We did some research with Edlin, I, I'd like to introduce soon. Then we have to do all the uh, modeling of the crops to, to figure out what is the yield potential of this crop, how we can get a yield and quality. Then maybe we have to talk about new varieties, varieties they are specially bred for indoor growing. And maybe we can change with this type of uh, production system, indoor production system, uh, we can increase the health promoting compounds in the plants itself. Then we have to do uh, marketing, we have to uh, explain to the customers what we are doing and why we de are doing this. And so the, the movie Margin came out. Actually this is, explains many, many things to many, many people. And now we get the question, oh wow, what's going on there? They're doing this like this and I never thought about this, yeah. First what we need in the morning is food and something to drink, yeah, most important. Not a new rocket or something like this. Uh, economy, we have to do this calculation in advance and of course if you're talking about cities, we, we have to involve the architecture as well. Should be looking nice or fancy, something like this. And I not talking about facility management. This is, uh, I got this um, information when we went to the Biosphere 2. Facility management is most important if you have such a flagship over there like the Biosphere 2, facility management. So we did some research, we're coming up to the light systems, what is the, maybe the best uh, light system, what is the best method to uh, supplemental, uh, supplement uh, the light to the plants and we did some research with uh, stress monitoring. We uh, developed a system, a method to detect uh, trace gases, ethylene, in the ambient air around the plants. So we're using hydroponics. More or less we all uh, familiar with the hydroponic systems. Actually this is a new system was developed in the, in the Netherlands called tri-hydroponic. It's a floating system but they raised up a little bit the, the plants itself to have a tri zone right here to prevent um, fungi diseases and something like this called a tri hydroponic. Actually if you look to the roots hanging in, in, in Newton solution you can't believe it but it's a little bit of distance between the, the plants itself and the water surface. Um, so with hydroponics actually we have many many systems available we can use these systems immediately for vertical farming. This is well known. We just take over the uh, technique from the greenhouse itself and we can start with hydroponics. The aquaponic system we have seen today, we are doing some research as well. I would suggest not bring the water back from the plant to the fish. If you have some problems then you can run in some problems with the water from the plant because we have a, I'd like to explain this, we have a, a law in Germany to protect plants from pesticides. You have a healthy food for the consumer. But if you have animals, you have to treat the animals well, if they get sick, you have to give them, give them animals medicine, antibiotica even if it's organic called production system. If you don't do this, if you treat uh, animals not well, not well, 
then you became a, you, you will get a criminal by law. And nowadays everybody has a smartphone in the pocket. They're doing pictures immediately, and they will send it immediately to the whatever internet, Facebook, whatever, and they will blame you, and then you have a problem. So I think I would suggest. Um, okay, coming over here, we can we can use the fish water. We can treat this ready for the plant as a solution, and then we can use 100% of this water for the plants and just use fresh water for the fish to have a safe fish production. Should be, fish production should be the priority because they are animals. There's no need actually to bring this water back to the fish. Why? Why? So now we'd like to talk about some results from our research. We developed a method for um, detection of plant stress um, in case of water or salt uh, stress in the root zone or uh, attack of an um, aphid or a disease. And we developed such a type of device. We have uh, plant chambers right here for single plants. We have a multi-wave or multiplexer and we measured ethylene with this device and we got figures uh, because we know in case of stress plants can immediately produce ethylene. Every single cell can do this. So this is how it looks like. So you have to take cast, uh, gas samples and bring it from the, from the plant, from the root zone, our ambient air, to the device right here. And then you will get the figures. And I'd like to show you some of the results. So we, back to the supplemental light, we used indoor, of course, supplemental light. And we used LED and we used HPS and we used uh, supplemental UV light. Um, yeah, you, you know actually this, so we, uh, we used LED and we could change the LEDs uh, very easily. We could change the, the spectrum, whatever, but for, for commercial use it's way too expensive. And if you look to this, this is our greenhouse facility. We have plant chambers right here, we're using HPS. And here we're using LED. We have the same plants over there. And we have almost the same growth. But the light is completely different. So the question is still what type of light the plants actually need. Actually, we have no idea right now. Not really. Not really. Yeah. We have different light sources. We let the plant grow. And I went this year to the Netherlands, to the growers, and I have seen three light sources for commercial tomato production in one greenhouse. Sunlight, HPS, plus um, LED light. And they install this in commercial greenhouses, two supplemental lights, plus the sun, solar light, to get the highest result. So, so we detect some, uh, or we introduce some plant stress, adding UV light. It looks like this. We use HBS lamps and we add UV light, as you can see here. This is coleus. This is a, a pot plant. We screened a lot of plants, uh, which we like to work on. And we got such type of results. If you have the wrong light or too much UV, you can actually burn or destroy the whole plant. And some results right here. There are three plants, the same light. And then we change to HPS is the green graph. Then HPS plus UVA is this one and UVB. When you can see if you change the light, the plant react within a few minutes and shows us or oh, there's something wrong. And in this case, we, we, we recognized there's some, some cells are destroyed from the plants itself, and there was a high production of ethylene within a few minutes. The time scale is minutes, as you can see here. So what does it mean? Actually, we found a method to detect plant stress in a short time. If you see some damage on the plant, it's too late. So some conclusions, we can 
measure ethylene. It's possible even it's a trace gas. We should look to the change of the values because we have no idea right now what does it mean if we're looking to the concentration itself. So we're looking to the change. If, if the ethylene concentration is changing, then we have a problem. Today we are talking about tomato production, maybe in a closed uh, lunar greenhouse, something like this, when we know tomatoes producing, when they ripen, producing ethylene. What's with this ethylene in the ambient air? If this ethylene goes to another plant chambers with lettuce, this lettuce will get a hard time, that's for sure, because it's a plant hormone. So we can get information about, about plant stress immediately, immediately, and we know if we, if we stress the roots, we can measure this in the roots. If we stress some plants, leaves, we can measure this in the ambient air above. But we can measure maybe in the root zone if there is a fungi attack on the leaves. So this is impossible. We have to measure where the stress occurs, where the stress uh, happens. And different uh, plant species uh, have different reaction, so we can use these results for all plants. So we have to uh, screen different plants to get results about plant stress itself. So then we took some uh, investigations to increase the so-called uh, health-promoting um, compounds or uh, health-promoting health phytochemicals. We used, in this case, rocket, rocket, and we, we add some UVB light for 20 minutes during night time. During night time, just 20 minutes during night time. And what happens, we switched on a secondary metabolism and we produced more of these um, health-promoting phytochemicals. And we got, uh, okay, this is one of the PhD students, he's doing this work. We, as you can see, we're working in three shifts in Germany at the same time. He's really, really a hard-working student. <laughs> so we're using, we're using um, in this case, aeroponic systems. So do, do you have single plants available and we can take off the plants and do some measurements like you're shown here. And we, find, we found a um, sig significant enhancement of this um, health-promoting phytochemicals after a short treatment of 20 minutes during night of this plant. So what does it mean? We can use this plants, we can use the spectrum of the plants to switch on or off some me metabolism and we get uh, better results and we maybe better qualities. So it means with a little bit of stress, plant stress or UV light, we can get better quality plants. So Back to some uh, figures about the efficiency of this type of uh, growing system of hydroponics. There are some uh, figures available of the water use efficiency. And if you're looking to the uh, how many liters we, we are need for an output of 100 US dollar. So as you can see, rice consuming a lot of water, cotton as well, sugar. Uh, sugar beets in this case, or uh, beef cattle. And then we're coming up to vegetable and fruits produced outside with drip irrigation so we can reduce this amount of water. And if you're coming up to hydroponics and even aquaponics, we have the lowest figure so we have the best water use efficiency in this particular case if you're using this type of system. So we fit this demand uh, when we're using hydroponics in vertical farms. Or the efficiency of uh, hydroponics. There are some results made in Europe uh, with soil culture in Spain, soilless culture in Spain, and high-tech soilless culture in, in, the in the Netherlands. And as you can see, you can increase with this technology the yield. With the yield, you can increase the price because you, ha you have a better quality. This results um, in higher uh, income, as you can see here in the next figure. Uh, of course, you have higher costs as well, but finally, the net income will increase. If this is a figure from uh, increase per hectare, will, um, four times higher if you're using 
hydroponic systems. These are figures from a greenhouse. We're not talking about uh, vertical farming. If you now you can add this in a, in a vertical farm as well um, to get the figures. So some conclusions. So we need new production systems for the future. We will come up um, uh, with systems that fits or they maybe the, the, the crops are following the population to the cities, yeah, the urbanization. We will get innovative production systems. We talking still about local production, short distances from production from the from the field to the to the table, sustainable production system. The economy and ecology should be in the balance. You're doing some research with a balance. You even you you can scale this in your greenhouse gene. We're coming up to clean food. This is the next demand: clean food like like water. And we we, we will label this in the future. We will label our vegetables clean. That that's for sure or pure. We we have to protect the farmland with this system. We have a good resource efficiency. We can create work and income for people in the cities. More research is needed that I have to mention because we are researchers and we always looking for money to do this work. And um, yeah, we are looking for German or uh, European projects in this in this particular case. This, this morning we talked about maybe cooperation between U.S. and Europe. Maybe this works. Then we should come up with a new design of systems. We got. This morning, best example of new designs right here. We need more efficient light sources. We need a good energy and facility management if we're dealing with uh, such uh, vertical farms. We have to think about plant physiology. Maybe the plants should be adapted this this environment. And this is most important issue. We should look for the most suitable crop system for a given situation, maybe in an urban area. So that's, we have plenty of opportunities to do this. We have many, many different hydroponic systems. We have different situations, maybe the climate, maybe the, the cities, maybe the policy, whatever. And then if you if you like to come up with such type of project, it should fit all the demands in this particular spot in the world, something like this. I like to Thank you. Thank you. Schön. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Thank you, oh. Dr. Fritz Schroeder. We appreciate it. questions. Let's let's go right to questions now. Oh, just one question. In English, please. Wrap it. Um, so, in closed environments, whether uh, greenhouses and especially vertical farming, uh, one of the things that you didn't mention is pollination, which in greenhouses, as you know, is done with uh, yeah, uh, bumblebees and so on. How would this work inside the city, inside closed environments? Uh, that's going to be a problem because the bumblebees need UV light for orientation. And uh, in this particular case, maybe we have to do this with a wind, or we have to shake this, or by hand, maybe. Uh, but on the other side, we're talking about leafly uh, vegetables like lettuce, and there's no pollination needed. But for for sweet pepper and for tomatoes, we need pollination. So, so that's going to be a problem. That that's for sure. Other questions. One of the things that struck me, uh, your proximity to a river uh, gives us an idea that the buildings in which you're working, uh, your ability to have layer after layer after layer of different types of growth depends on the structure of the buildings yeah. and the geology underlying it. And I see the possibility that you can go down quite a distance and your potential for raising shrimp, fish, and other aquaculture yeah. opportunities is uh, only limited by your design capacity. Yeah, right. So uh, how far do you want to go, and how much will your market take 
once you double or triple your productivity. Yeah, yeah, right. And as a German, so we're doing very well to export all our products, uh, something like this. So the German market is not ready for this type of production right now, that's for sure. Maybe a showcase, we can show how it works, like an exhibition, something like this. But we like to develop um, methods and system for export for really big cities. The biggest city in Germany is Berlin with three and a half million people. So this means nothing. It's not a mega city. I'm talking about mega cities in Africa or maybe in, in uh, Asia and they're working on such systems as well. So, And these cities or these, these uh, populations are ready to use this. They will appreciate this. That, that's for sure. The so, Saudis have yeah. already established in Ethiopia yeah. uh, sources Yep. So the issue of understanding supply and demand on the global scale is important to your planning for export. It, it's, it's right. So, uh, But what we like to do, use is uh, buildings that already exist. So there are no use for this. So we don't have to rebuild them. We have to check is there, is there possibilities to use them or the facilities over there or the utilities over there. So that's what, what we're looking for for customized solutions. You've also set an excellent example if by Germany and uh, uh, Denmark presently have done so good a job with wind and solar power yep. that you're setting an example of excellence for the world. Now how do you optimize that and provide it to enhance your gross domestic product? Yeah, we, we like to use this, but on the other side, all the developments and the, all the alternative energy uh, power plants or something like this leads to the highest cost of energy because we have to pay for this. So we, we are paying the bill. Yeah, and 30, 30, 30 euro cent per kilowatt is a lot. It's a lot. And you will switch off the, the lights when you're leaving the room. Fritz, uh, your idea on the brick-borne farming is very interesting. Are, are there, I, I heard that this proposal wasn't funded, but are there any of these brick older buildings that have been repurposed successfully? or yep. It's being done on a smaller scale than what you just showed. Um, okay. Now, we got in this year about three questions from property managers and owners um, in industrial areas, and um, we are working on. And uh, another question came from the processing uh, industry from French, and the French prefer white lettuce, white. And they're using, right now, they're using the heart of a lettuce, and they dump about 80% of the lettuce because it's green. And they asked, there was a special request, can you produce white lettuce for our French customer? Never send French astronauts up to the orbit, never do this. <laughs> they, they have special demands. <laughs> but maybe we can fit them, so. <laughs> so. So this was a demand from from industry with a turnover of 100 million. So they're asking for this. They have a processing facility and they're dumping, especially for this product, 80% of the lettuce, the production, from the open field. Um, what, I, what I see about vertical farming, the potential is that uh, um, in big cities, you don't have enough open space for people and I think that if you had a high-rise with a greenhouse that was an arboretum or a place for a park, that you could, it could add value to the, the rents paid by the people, and the managers would find more use to having a, a park rather than a, 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 a crop production facility. You're right. And right now we have this problem in Germany. We are running out of apartments because we have so many immigrants. Now we have this problem, and three months before, five months before, we had plenty of uh, empty apartments. So empty houses, blocks completely empty. Not anymore. Yeah, I agree with you. Depends on the situation, what happens right now. But the potential in the city itself, it's enorm well, enormous. What, you know, like your slaughterhouse. Yeah. Um, if that had a nice park greenhouse on top, then uh, you could probably make those apartments in there. Yeah. Uh, we, we came up with this uh, system as well, roof uh, or 
greenhouse on the rooftop, yes, and there's a large potential as well, but nobody can pay the bill for the energy cost to heat it up in the winter, believe me. That's well, the problem. A high-rise, you yeah. know, let's say a 30-story high-rise, huh. they run their air conditioner year-round because they the lighting accumulates so much heat That's right. that, it, you know, if you were in a big, tall building, you wouldn't have to w worry about heating the thing. No, if you're using supplemental light, you have to cool this. This is for sure. With the with a LED or with a HBS lamps, they're producing too much energy, or more and more heat than than light. That's the problem right now. Yeah, yeah, but I'm talking about <laughs> yeah. the people we have in, to the, in them the building now. themselves, yeah. in the offices, generating the heat. Yeah. You know, yeah, greenhouse. but this this combination, I'm, I don't think so that that will work. So. We have a production side and office side in the same moment, and uh, there are a lot of transport and noise and something like this, maybe. It's a nice idea. I heard about this type of project, so combine offices in the front of the offices. There are some sort of greenhouses where you can look from your office in a nice green environment, something like this. They build up right now in Linköping in Sweden, such type of uh, vertical farm. It's, it's, it's In New York, uh, if you had a place to go upstairs and eat your lunch in this park environment, then you don't get mugged when you go outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, well, seven-second delay. We'll get rid of that part there. Uh, we don't want New Yorkers coming, I guess. Um, question uh, from the, from the yeah. Internet, uh, yeah. and I'm not so sure I'm understanding the, the question. Um, we hope we will put this entire presentation online so that uh, yeah. those who uh, miss things can, can come back and see it. Uh, there is interest for your PowerPoint presentation. We'll, we'll discuss that later. But um, one question really deals with your um, uh, the aquaponic system. You seem to propose that it should be a one-way flow of water because you don't want to bring the water back to the fish because you'll become a criminal if one of your fish dies. Yeah, I tell you, we'd be in big trouble here. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. Um, uh, so, how do you deal with all the water that you're going to be discharging from the aquaponics system? No, you can. The, the plants should take off at least um, in the first cycle 70 percent, 80 percent of the water. So they're consuming the water, and the leftovers, 20 percent, 30 to 20 percent, you can have a second circle to to maintain this, to control this pH and EC, and bring it back to the plants. Not to the fish. Why? Okay, so once the, it reaches the plant, it stays yeah, in the plant. It stays size. stays in the plant size, and you can you can maintain this over there. You can adjust pH and EC as much as you want for the plants itself, but not bring it back. That, then you have two cycles, and you can run into problems. You pay a lot more for your electrical power than we do. Yes. Factor of three, but I bet you pay a lot less in your water bill. No, 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 no. Even if you have plenty of water, we have to pay in Germany for the rainfall on our roof per square meter. Our government find every uh, slot to tax you. Yeah, we have to pay for rainwater. Believe me, because this rainwater is flushed into the water treatment facilities, and we have to pay for this. Even for rainwater which falls on your ground on the field, you have to pay for this. And we pay, I can tell you, we pay for uh, uh, fresh water about with weight, wastewater treatment per, per cubic meter, per 1,000 liter, we pay about 7 to 8 euro per cubic meter, 1,000 liter. Without wastewater treatment, we pay about 3 to 4 euro one, for one cubic meter. <sighs> That's the cheapest. What, what is a good bottle of water cost in Germany? In, we have a law in Germany because beer is the cheapest drink which is available in a restaurant. Each restaurant has to serve at least one soft drink cheaper than beer. This is a German law. And I got the bill last year. We had our 25 year anniversary with my wife. I invite all the families, 50, 60 people or 70 people. It was a hot summer day, afternoon, and they start drinking water. I got the water bill. I was shocked. Next time I tell my friends and relatives, drink beer and wine. It's less expensive. 
I got a water bill. It was incredible. Drinking, we, we pay about five to seven euro for a bottle of water in the restaurant. Water, and we have plenty of them. You will get water for free in the restaurant here, but not in Germany. Yeah, maybe you can if you pay or order cheap water in the restaurant, three euro, four euro, something like this, a bottle. A glass, a glass, yeah, not a bottle. So this is our situation. Another question? Um, so in the in these systems that are totally closed, we're using 100% artificial lighting. Yeah. So lighting is a big uh, energy, um, produces a lot of energy requirement yeah, in, yeah. in these environments. How are you going to overcome the energy balancing these systems. Yeah. We, we're thinking about uh, alternative energy. We like to cover all the surface of the house, of the building itself with solar uh, panels to generate your own energy. And you will get, even for this, if you're doing this, um, subsidies from the government in Germany right now, we like to add some other uh, energy sources like wind generator, something like this, to, to get your own energy for this building. That's what we're looking for. And we like to do this like this. We like to have shifts for the plants itself. So we have day and night shifts. So we, we have a, a constant power uh, cons consumption over there. So that's maybe will will work. So we're working on this. Thank you. Yeah. Creative idea. I like this. <laughs> Here the microphone. We have a great idea we're about to hear. Yeah. Please. No, no, no. You know uh, that little bottle of five hour Yes, energy. yeah. Now, are you familiar with the creator of that and how rich he became? Of course, yeah. Yes. And all of the wonderful things that he wants to do with it. Well, one of those things is to create a bike type pedal thing that he could put someone on to pedal the energy. You pedal the, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, 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 we know this from the wheel, yeah, though. Create, yeah, 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 yeah. Like that, that works. That type yeah. of thing. And I understand, how, how, many, uh, how many people have you brought in from other countries like Syria and such? Hmm. Uh, how are you going to be dealing with the energy and, and the, the needs of those people, and do you have jobs for them? Um, uh, I can't answer the political question, but Great question. Germany, believe me, we are a rich country and we have a decreasing population since years. That's why we have so many empty apartments and we have about one million open job offers right now. The industry is searching for labor everywhere right now. And maybe this is an opportunity for Europe or for Germany, but how to handle this in detail? They are just causing many, many problems right now, right, right, right now. But we will handle this. Uh, I'm sure I trust our politics. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. We all trust our politics. <laughs> um, there is a the question way, online yeah. um, from a former uh, PhD student here asking about, from someone else too, there's two questions, about the air pollution in the cities and how that may affect the safety or the quality of the product growing in the open. Uh, for, for this particular reason, we have to use air filters. That's for sure like in our cars. So we have to use air filters because the pollution is too, way too much and we have the problems with um, uh, so-called uh, solid matter or fine dust. What's, what's the fine um, But particular, yeah, for something like this, this, this can cause problems. So, so we have to use, we have to use uh, air filters for this, of course. We're getting near the end. Yeah. The last question right here. I was wondering in your example of the closed uh, building yeah. Modify. How do you handle the uh, humidity in those things? Yeah. And what do you do with that water? You turn that to the oxygen. Yeah, you have a lot of condense, yeah, of course. You you have to handle this, and we know the condense is really low pH, and we have to adjust the pH again, but we can use reuse this again. That's that's for sure. We we, we like to heat heat exchange or something like this. We will get a lot of condense, uh, and so but this we can handle. Um, before, before we come to the end, actually, we're talking about fancy new developments, I like to introduce a development from my former students, and they came up with a bottle crop. This is the smallest 
hydroponic system works without maintenance or something like this. That's a website. They came out now. They're selling this in Europe as a, as a bottle crop, and it works quite well for maybe for my grandchildren. So they turn to four years, and they present it once, and it's easy to do. Just put the seed inside and uh, fill up with with water. Put the seed into this uh, funnel right there, and then at the end it looks like this. And after 30 days, if there's enough light, it's it's done, and no work, no hands-on. That that works and to understand, to teach, even the youngest in the kindergarten, this works. So, so I'd like to end with an even simple solution, but it looks simple, but isn't this? Yeah. <laughs> but it looks so fresh and clean. Yeah, yeah perfect. actually, that's what you were trying. Actually, to do. it is. Actually, it is. If you look to the roots and to the, to the leaves, and you can eat the roots too. But to to teach to teach students, even students in the preschool or something like this, it works very well. Yeah. Put a fish in there. He said, put a goldfish. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, put the cold fish in. Oh, thank you for this. This is a great idea. <laughs> but <laughs> okay, I, I think we'll bring this to a close right now. It's uh, getting about that time. I want to thank everyone for for coming here. Yeah. I want to thank Dr. Schroeder yeah. for your great presentation. Please. Oh, thank you very much. And I'll I'll remind everyone that we're back here in one week on December 11th for Dr. Merle Jensen. He's going to talk about future, the past, the, the controlled environment of the birth of an agricultural revolution. And you can hear it right here next week. I would like to Thank come you. over to see this entertainer again. Okay. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. We don't have to go online. Here. Yeah. Okay, everybody in the room, you're welcome to grab a bag and make some produce. There is so many more produce out there, too. Oh, excellent. I got a little worried about that.